talking about this library donut system. Uh, it's a, another component library in the vein of Stuart Sierra's component and also Integrant, but I'm also going to be talking a little bit about you know, the subjects of beginner friendliness and intuitive design. Um, so this is uh, like more of like a casual chat. This isn't, I don't, I don't have necessarily fully formed ideas uh, for, for everything that I'm going to be talking about here, but this is me just kind of wanting to share, um, share where I am. I'm sorry if you hear my cat in the background. Um, just like sharing, sharing these concepts as I've, as I've been working on these tools, hopefully to, um, yeah, spur conversation and then, you know, like, I'm also hoping to collaborate with folks too on the stuff that I'm working on, uh, if you are interested in it. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to mention, I have like some tea here. This is London Closure and so it felt like it was appropriate. And this Spanish casual chat is an Eddie Azard reference, if you are familiar with that. Um, anywho, uh, I have a, a, something to share. I have a, a secret obsession. So I just for a long time, I've been really, <clears throat> mulling him over in my brain, like, how do we, like, how do we build a more beginner friendly culture community, uh, sorry, closure community um, <clears throat> and culture. And I, I just like, I, you know, I've been working on um, a few different ideas around this, right? Um, going to closure community. So one of them is, you know, I have this, my little job board, Brave Closure Jobs. Um, but then I've also been, on the side, like in secret, in my spare time working on this framework that I've been kind of reluctant to share for a long time, but I feel like it's, I'm finally ready to start showing it. Um, and what I wanna do with this framework is make it significantly easier to launch and grow a SaaS product, right? So something like Rails, you know, where it's, um, it's, it's really easy. You don't necessarily have to be super experienced to get going, get started and, you know, building an application that can provide real value and that like where, you know, as you learn more and become more experienced, you can then do more. Um, so this framework that I've been working on has like back end, uh, back end piece, uh, front end piece, and there's also some pieces around deployment. And what I, what I want eventually too, is to have like the ability to integrate with like third-party services, use plugins, things like that, to do things like Google Auth, um, to be able to compose like plugins and, you know, build an application that way, which I think is in some ways not necessarily like encouraged in the closure community, but I think that that's you know worth worth uh, pushing against or changing. So this fr framework I've been working on is called Donut. Um, it's a few reasons for the name. One is that I like donuts. Another is that everyone likes donuts. I feel like the name hits you right in the in the dopamine, you know. Um, and uh, you know, lets me use like pictures like this, which automatically gets you kind of interested, I think. So it's purely, you know, it's marketing ploy to get people salivating, so to speak, for a sweet new technology that can help people out. <clears throat> um, but there's a couple, there's a couple aspects of this. And so I'm gonna be kind of doing stuff uh, in public a little bit more around building a friendly and supportive culture. So me and a few other folks like Arna, um, Brasseur and uh, Paul Guerin and uh, Jordan Miller and Mike Fikes, for example, are, are cooking up a little kind of be beginner friendly um, meetup, which we're going to be announcing pretty soon. Um, so, like, that's the culture side. But then on the kind of technology side, I, I wanted to share just some of the thoughts that I've been that have been swirling around in my brain around uh, design when it comes to technology and building tools. So. Um, what I want to talk about here a little bit is just this idea of like beginner driven design. You know, how do you make tools and libraries beginner friendly? And what are the broader design implications? So uh, I'm going to be drawing mostly from this one book, Intuitive Design. Um, so this is about user interface design, but you know, design concepts in general are um, broadly applicable. You know, if you are interacting with something or using something, um, there are a lot of just general design concepts that you can draw on. And I like this, like this definition of an intuitive design. Um, this guy, Everett McKay says, a design is intuitive if the user can successfully complete the task without reasoning, experimentation, memorization, documentation, or training. Which I like that because I feel like that's a really tall order actually when it comes to code, right? Like 
you want someone to be able to like use your library without documentation, like that's, you know, probably unlikely to happen. But I like this from an aspirational st standpoint of like, you know, you want to you want to be able to build libraries and tools that <clears throat> work that people can use without having to um, really work too hard to, to figure it out and like, you know, without having to make too many mistakes um, along the way. So um, with that kind of definition in hand, oh, <laughs> uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about um, interacting with tools. And I'm going to basically read some slides, which I know is a presentation, no, no. So, um, you know, you can judge me if you will. Um, so in this book, this guy breaks down the interaction life cycle of uh, setting a goal, finding a starting point and performing an action, and then observing the action's results. Like, was the goal achieved? And if so, then you continue on or else you fix problems and try again. And so uh, for us in our context, right, this could be like, if you are like being onboarded onto a project or you are trying to create your, you know, your SaaS app, you know, from scratch for the first time, right? Like this is what people are going to be going through in order to use the tools that we're building, right? Setting a goal, finding the starting point, performing some action, like maybe that's starting a REPL, running command at the command line and observing the results and figuring out if the goal was achieved. Like, did it throw an exception? Can I open up my, like uh, the, the URL in my, uh, my browser and, and see something useful there? You know, that these ideas definitely apply to what we are doing. Um, and so the author, Everett McKay, then goes on to talk about, uh, goes on to talk about the problems that a user can encounter when using some tool. And right, so the, the user could be unsure about what to do next, right? How do you actually get started? I mean, you see this question a lot um, in Closure Land. Like, how do I how do I actually build a web app? Like, why do I how do I make an an application, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, they could be unable to find a starting point, or they could choose the wrong starting point. Uh, they could make a mistake performing an action that could just be something as simple as a typo, right? Um, or they might not be able to observe the results, or they could be misled by feedback um, or results, right? So like stack traces, anybody, right? Um, and if there's a problem, no error, of uh, there could be no error feedback, or the user doesn't understand what to do about it, which again, like stack traces, right? Um, so, <clears throat> uh, Everett McKay goes on to say like, that to fix the problem, a motivated user is extremely inconvenienced, often having to start the interaction completely over. By contrast, the unmotivated user just might give up. And so this is part of like, um, th this is where my mind goes. I, I think about like the folks who, who want to learn closure and want to do something useful in closure. And you know, some of some some of these folks are pretty motivated, you know, because they've heard a lot of good things about closure, but they might encounter too many problems along the way and then eventually give up. And then we don't hear about them, we don't know about them. And I think that that's sad because these this is a great language, it does have great tools. Um, I just wanted to make it easier uh, for for people to get started building something useful. Um, so that people who if they're unmotivated for whatever reason. Uh, don't um, don't have these kind of these problems and don't have these reasons to to give up. So um, when it comes to this like the specific library that I'm going to be talking about, uh, Donut System, um, the tasks involved are like adding a component, modifying a component, debugging issue, writing a test. Um, you can think of more, just like these are kind of typical development tasks. Um, and so, you know, I've been thinking about like, okay, like as different people might be trying to use the, the tools that we build, right? What are the tasks that they're trying to perform and how can we help them in performing those tasks, right? Like, what, like how do we you know, design the tools well um, so that they can be used intuitively? And in thinking about this stuff, I, you know, one of the thoughts I had was like, well, it's not just performing tasks, it's actually, performing tasks in some context, right? So um, I, I think car, like car dashboard user, user interfaces are kind of notoriously bad, right? And you know, what's interesting about like a, a car dashboard user interface is like, okay, maybe you can figure this out. Like if you were in your car, like just parked in your driveway, you know, you could kind of muddle through and figure these things out. But like where this becomes a problem is when the context changes, if you are actually driving. And when you're driving, your attention or resources are 
are, are very much um, dedicated to uh, a more important task at hand. And you know, if you're trying to do like perform these other actions that take away from those resources, like it can be life threatening, right? <clears throat> so it's not just task, but task plus context. So you know, in thinking about this idea of beginner driven beginner driven design, I started to think about it as like, well, this is just really part of the context. Being a beginner is just one of many contexts that you know developers can find themselves in. You know, beginners are inexperienced, and another way of putting that is that they have they lack access to knowledge and skills that more experienced people have. You know, um, <clears throat> just like going back to that car example, um, someone can know how to operate their their uh, you know dashboard UI, but when they're driving, they can actually lack access to the that knowledge and those skills because their attentional resources are occupied with something else. And the same thing can happen to developers, right? We can, um, you know, the access can be removed if we haven't touched the code for months or if we're part of an organization that's understaffed, or maybe you have to change some code in response to an emergency, or maybe you're experiencing poor health or lack of sleep, or I don't know, you're in the middle of a global pandemic, um, or there's poor documentation, or you're simply hungover, or perhaps you're a non-native speaker. These are all things that can impact someone's ability to use the stuff that we build, right? And I think it's important to consider these things because, you know, these are all like shifts in context that any one of us can experience or like experience most of them, you know, and that can affect our ability to like really use these tools and perform at a more expert level. So in a way, it's like all of us can become beginners by experiencing these hindrances, right? We, we, we enter the same context as a beginner. And so this is like, why I've been thinking it's important to just really to iterate on, on tools and resources to make them beginner friendly. Uh, there are also some other context um, differences, like you don't actually, like maybe someone doesn't actually care about the tech, they only, uh, they only care about building the thing. Um, if you wanna use a guitar metaphor, maybe someone doesn't want to learn like master guitar, maybe they just wanna learn a few chords to play a song which I think is totally valid, right? Or maybe, you know, they heard a secret chord that pleases the Lord and they just wanna play that. They will, don't wanna like entirely learn how to, how to play anything on guitar. And I think that that's okay too. And I think that that's a worthwhile mindset to have, you know, in building tools and resources for, for people in the closure community, right? So this is all about making things accessible to beginners and beginner friendly. So, um, I don't know, as I've been going about trying to like build this stuff, uh, I've been really trying to pay attention to like, what are the hindrances here that like I've kind of designed into the system? Like, can I identify them and, re and remove them? And um, I don't know, I just like the idea of like owning that as your responsibility and taking professional pride in it. I mean, not to get too preachy about it, but that's just kind of where my mind is. Um, Another kind of related idea is that just for me, I have this, this attitude of that everybody deserves to be here, you know? And this is the opposite of the attitude that I think can be present in some places. Um, where, where, you know, if, if, you know, we see someone struggling with something that we build, like one thing that we can, like one place that we can go to mentally is just to kind of blame the person like, oh, they're like, <clears throat> They, they, they're just maybe they're too, they're too lazy to figure it out or something like that, or they're just not smart enough or something like that. And I, it, like, it makes me, it feels painful for me to even say this, right? Because I don't think that that's generally the mindset that people have, but you definitely, I mean, I think everyone's seen that out there on the, you know, the global internet. Um, so in any case, in, in kind of taking these like beginner focused um, uh, or making these beginner focused moves, um, this is something I'm trying to explicitly keep in mind. It's just that like, yeah, you know, if someone's building, like they, they want to build an app for the first time, like they're new to coding, like, yeah, they deserve to be here and they should be supported. I want to support them. And I think it's, you know, building this culture of supporting people um, is something that I personally enjoy. So um, so this is the, kind of like the, the, the longer answer to the question of why another component library, right? And the, 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 the reason here, the rationale here is that as I use the tools that are out there, which are good, I'm not trying to, to knock them. I used, for example, Integrant for a very long time and I really liked it. But as I, um, as I was trying to put together this framework and 
um, I, I ran into like a, some some stumbling blocks with Integrant. And I think about this from the perspective of like, okay, this is maybe this is someone's very first coding project, and they want to put, you know, they have some idea that they want to put out there. They want to like better their life by launching their little their their business. And if they're running into some of these like kind of um, uh, gnarlier aspects of using Integrant, right? Like, how much is this going to impact them? And is it possible to build something that's better? That's one aspect of kind of like where I'm coming from with building this library. And another one is that um, I, I, I want it to be this kind of foundation for removing these hindrances in the sense of, you know, being able to actually compose plugins and support usability, which I, uh, I, I remember from my, you know, Rails days, you know, there were, um, there were these, you know, plugins that you could use to handle authentication and like these other common concerns, which aren't necessarily core to the problem that you're trying to solve, but they would generally work off the shelf. And maybe there'd be like, you know, some issues, but for the most part, uh, you could get a lot of value after um, out of, you know, taking one of these off the shelf components and just kind of plugging it in and at least, uh, you know, making progress, at least make progress on the, on the, the application that you're trying to build. And it's like, it's kind of curious to me that we don't really have much of that like, in the closure world, right? Um, I also just want to give a quick uh, shout out to you know Stuart Sierra and James Reeves, James Reeves and Dominic Monroe. Um, so like they, they built the other kind of component libraries. Um, I didn't uh, mention Mount because I haven't used it myself. I know a lot of people liked it uh, or like it. Um, but anyway, uh, um, I just want to you know thanks thank these folks for for their work that like I'm building on top of trying to build on top of. So. Um, <clears throat> That's kind of the like where my mind is and what I'm trying to do here. Um, there's a there's a donut channel on Clojure and Slack where like if any of this stuff is interesting to you and you want to um, be involved somehow and, and and keep talking about this stuff, then it'd be great to hang out with people there, and chat about it. And uh, I guess that's it for the whole kind of preamble and intro. So what's going on here? So. Without further ado, um, we'll go ahead and get into the code portion of the presentation. So let's look at Donut component library. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with libraries like uh, Stuart Sierra's component and Integrant, um, the, the general idea behind these, and I'm not going to go to like, I'm not going to explore the, the kind of rationale behind one of these libraries. Um, in general, because I feel like there are a lot of good resources out there for them already, but I'll briefly say that um, part of the, the purpose of these libraries is to have a way to um, organize your system, uh, like uh, your, your, your application, um, uh, makes it possible to, to kind of decompose your application into these separate components, which allows a kind of layer or a degree of isolation um, it can make it easier to um, work on different parts of your system um, in isolation. And then also these libraries provide uh, an abstraction or like an interface for um, com common um, <clears throat> behaviors that uh, your components will have. So like um, these abstractions will pro provide basically like uh, a common interface for starting and stopping components. Like, so, you know, if you wanna start a web server, you know, there's a, uh, you can build a component for that, or if you need to start like a database connection pool or thing, you know, things like that, um, you have a kind of systematic way of defining these behaviors and then also defining the dependencies which like among the components. So um, hopefully that, that kind of made sense. Uh, if not, then I know that uh, James Reuss, for example, when talking about Integrant does a really good job of explaining um, you know, the, the overall rationale behind these uh, component or dependency injection libraries. <clears throat> All right, so actually I'm going to take a sip real here, uh, real quick here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so how do you actually use Donut System? Well, to start, uh, you create a map, and this is going to be a system map. And you have one key in the system app, and this is um, DS defs. And this contains your component definitions. 
And under, under this map, um, there's a, a nested map where at the top level, you have these keys, which are group names. And below that, or like with, within that, I should say, um, you have another map where the keys are the names of components. So um, this is already like one, one difference between donut system and the kind of prevalent libraries out there, which is that groups are a first class concept. Um, in defining a component, you have yet another map. And for a component, you define what are called signal handlers. So these are start and stop in this case. And signal handlers are just functions that take three arguments. The first argument is the config or conf. The second argument is an instance or a, a component instance. And the third argument is the entire system map um, as it exists at the point that the signal handler is called. All right. So um, this component that we're defining here is an HTTP, HTTP server component. And you can see the start signal handler um, calls run Jetty. So Jetty is an HTTP server. And um, the argument that it takes here is just a request handler. And so this the, the component, when it starts, just starts a server. And you can see there's another signal handler here, stop. And you can see that it ignores the first argument and takes as its second argument instance. And so the instance is whatever is returned by the start handler up here that gets stored when stop gets called that gets uh, the instance gets passed in and then you can then call stop on that server. And then the third key that you hear, see here conf. Um, this is the value for this can be anything and it just gets passed in as the first value to the signal handlers. So start and stop, both signal handlers, all the signal handlers take the same three arguments of conf, instance, and system. It's just that in general, start um, for start, you're gonna care about the conf. For, uh, for stop, you're gonna care about the instance. And um, there are some cases where you care about system, but I might not necessarily call, uh, cover them on this uh, in this presentation, but they're detailed in the readme. And uh, so um, I'll mention here, so like this conf you can see it has these options of like a message. So this is the message that um, the server uh, will display for any requests. And then there's like options for the server itself. So you can see these get destructured. Uh, the argument here, we call run jetty. And in the, in the handler, we have this message. Um, it's going to say it's donut system, baby. And then the options are like which port uh, this should run on. And join is. <clears throat> Just to say, like to not, like you know, keep the thread free. So, um, so I believe I actually already started that. I started this before um, starting the presentation here. Oh, maybe I didn't. And run this. So I'm going to create this running system. Um, I create that by calling this function uh, donut system signal. And the first argument that you pass in is some system, which is this map up here. And then you give it the name of the signal. So start. All right. So great. Now we got a server running. Um, now to stop the system, we just call DS signal stop on the running system. And you can see like now the server has stopped. And let's see here. Um, one thing to note here is that when you call like DS signal, um, the return value for that is an updated system map. So um, let's see here. You can inspect it in the REPL. Um, you can see like it's a pretty large map. Um, and then, or we can just like focus on certain uh, keys within that map. So this returns just the component definitions and then. Um, it also returns the component instances. So earlier when I said that like, you know, server start uh, returns, um, you know, uh, an instance that gets stored in the system map. And that's how it's then fed back into the other signal handlers like stop. All right. 
Okay. Um, let's see here. Next thing that we're going to look at is how to uh, declare dependencies by using local and full refs. So um, this is another thing that differentiates this library from the other libraries out there. So you can have this, uh, yep, there's this idea of a, a local ref, which uh, refers to a component in the same group. And there's also a full ref, which refers to a component in a different group. So here we have another system definition and you can see we've defined, we have our component defs and we have this HTTP group again. And within this, you can see that there is a, um, a local ref here to handler. So handler is another component within the same group, right? And then uh, under options, we have this uh, port ref to like environment HTTP port. And so the, this is more like a fully qualified name, right? So it takes the group name and the uh, component name to refer to some component outside of the same group. So um, when you declare, when you use refs like this, um, what happens when you uh, start a, a system is that these, um, these refs are used to start the components in a topologically sorted order. So for example, since this, a server component refers to the handler. Um, start is going to get called on the handler first so that some instance of that can be created. And then the handler here is actually going to, um, this like DS ref value is going to be replaced by the instance that's returned when you call the start signal handler um, for, this is a little bit confusing, I'm realizing, um, for, for the handler component. So, uh, Hopefully that makes sense. Um, likewise, with this port, um, the it's gonna the system uh, the library is gonna call start on this component um, before it calls start on this server server component. Uh, another thing to mention here is that it's possible to just have constant instances. So you can see here the the component definition for HTTP port HTTP port is just the constant value 8080. It's not a map of like, you know, start. So that's just like a little convenience. Um, and uh, I think that's another thing that's, um, you know, the, the ability to just um, to, to define components and define like th their behavior without too much ceremony. Um, was something that I was also trying to go for in creating this library. I'm seeing lots of chat uh, messages here. Um, okay. Um, let's see what else to mention here. I think that's it for this section. So um, if we start this little system, you can see like we have this handler now that's um, separated out from the, the server component. Like so in the, in the last example, we saw that like the handler was defined, you know, directly in the um, in, inside the server. And now we split that out and uh, we started the system and we can see that now it's uh, giving a new message, uh, donut system refs maybe. And everything is going as planned. So um, let's see here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about groups here. Um, so groups make it easier to create multiple instances of components, and they also make it easier to provide plugins or libraries, or at least that's the intention, right? And the, the thinking here is that often, I mean, often, if you're, if you're trying to define like some set of behavior or provide a library that provides some set of behavior, then in fact, like it's, it's natural to actually define this as like some group of related components, right? So um, that's why I want to like to provide this as a first class concept so that people, um, 
if they're, they're writing a library can, you know, define the set of related components. In this case, it's server, handler, and port, and be able to reference these um, different components within uh, within a group without having to know some kind of like globally, uh, you know, some, some kind of global name or global address for, for your components, which is kind of the case in, in Integrant, which uh, I'll show in a second. So let's see here. Um, another another uh, you know, reason here for, uh, which I mentioned for, for creating component groups is that it makes it a lot easier to create multiple instances of, of components. So we can see that at play here in this system, like let's say for some reason, you wanna create two HTTP servers um, and you want those to run at the same time. So this component group becomes basically a kind of uh, template for, for creating an HTTP server. And um, what you can then do is just say like, all right, I'm going to create multiple instances of this, um, you know, of these components by just putting them in separate groups, right? So in this component definition map that we have here, the separate group, group names are HTTP1 and HTTP2. And then we can just take the component group map and um, modify that component definition, for example, by specifying a port, um, you know, specifying what message the different servers should display. And oops, I'm going to go ahead and start this system. Oops, what do we got here? There we go. So now um, you can see at localhost 8080, there is the you can see like the HTTP one server is running, and on localhost 9090, it's HTTP two, and so that behavior is created by taking this base component group definition and saying that for you know um, component group one, I want to define the port as referring to this value 8080, and, and I want the message to just be HTTP one. And likewise with HTTP two, um, you can you know, just easily configure this um, to, to you know, customize the behavior across the different uh, component groups that you want to use. All right, so I feel like this is like really getting into um, getting into the, the weeds of like, gosh, how do you use component libraries and like what what are the um, corner cases and where can people get tripped up? And so, if for folks who are like not necessarily like super well versed in integrant and whatnot, this might seem like really um, kind of focused on minutia, but um, hopefully. Uh, hopefully it's making sense. And, and also I'm hoping that the, the kind of the value comes across of like, you know, if you can create this set of related components and just plug that in your system anywhere you want to by just using these different group names, that makes it um, a bit easier and a bit more possible to have these plugin libraries, right? All right, um, let's see here. Uh, so another idea with, with like providing these plugin libraries or, or plugins um, is that we can create tools to declare required dependencies. So if someone wanted to make, make their HTTP library that anyone can just plug in, they can define the, the structure of their components and they can um, actually like define that some, some components need to be overridden by whoever is using the library. And you can see, uh, see that here with this, excuse me, with this component donut system required component, right? So um, the way that this component group is set up is that we have a server just like before, it's running Jetty just like before, and then uh, you, know, you can stop it. Um, the configuration for this has a reference to um, the port local component, right? And so that's just saying like, if you were to you know, package this in a library for someone else to use, you could say like, okay, um, the server refers to some port, but the port component itself um, by default has this uh, required component there. 
So um, if someone were to try to use this without actually defining a port, you would get an exception. So we'll try that right now with like running a running the system. And you can see this exception comes up and it says, uh, this is an exception info and it says need to define required component. And it gives you the component ID, which is HTTP one port. So, um, you know, earlier when I was talking about these details of like, what if you run into a problem? Is it clear what the problem is and, and how to fix it? Uh, these are the kinds of kind of details I'm, I'm trying to, you know, to, to work with and explore, um, you know, how, how do we kind of provide this kind of feedback to people to make their experience nicer? So if we were to, instead of using this required component component, um, you know, we just had nil here, right? What would the, like, what would the exception look like? So we haven't defined a port. Actually, I think in this case, it's like um, Jetty will, will actually, I think, uh, start it. Um, oh, wait, no, I'm wrong about that. Uh, in this case, we get like a different, a different exception saying that there's a reference to port that hasn't been defined. So there's kind of like, I guess, layers of, um, you, know, you know, feedback here that's meant to be helpful. Um, let's see here. And if you're wondering what this required component does, um, basically its implementation is something like this, where it has a start signal handler and the start signal handler just throws an exception, you know, need to define required component. And then earlier I mentioned that there's a system map that gets passed in as a third argument. And out of that system map, you can pass in the current component ID of whatever, whatever component um, the system is trying to, to start. Right. So uh, let's see here. So that, that's just like one little example of, you know, how I'm trying to design this thing to be beginner friendly. You know, give us a few more affordances and, and uh, tools for, for providing accurate feedback. Well, let's see here. Next we have, um, so then this next part, I'm going to compare donut system with integrant a little bit to more explicitly draw out some of the some of the issues that I ran into with integrant and how I think that maybe donut does things a little bit better. Which again, I always feel bad like I don't want to you know throw shade integrant because I do think it's a good library. But uh, in any case, um, I do think that this that donut solves some problems, and I want to show you all and see what you think and uh, hopefully get, get your feedback on it. Um, <clears throat> oh. uh, let's see here. So um, I mentioned earlier this idea that with donuts, it's you're able to create multiple instances of like the same group of components um, pretty, pretty easily. And so this is a kind of stripped down um, almost like a little bit pseudocodish pseudo uh, example. And the, the idea here is like, let's say you, you have some component where you want to start a server, but you also have some network discovery service so that when you start your server, you know, this network discovery service like registers it with some kind of central directory of, you know, the, the uh, servers running on, on your, your organization's internal network, right? And you can see here, like, it's not actually doing anything. This is just to, you know, just, just to provide an example. And uh, it's maybe a little bit contrived, but you know, bear with me. Um, so with, uh, with uh, don't, I don't know if you all can hear that, my dog's uh, making sleep noises in the background. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. But uh, in any case, so for the system definition, um, once again, we have these two separate component groups, um, HTTP one and HTTP two, and um, it's it's pretty easy to just like plug these in and things just work. Um, if you wanted to do this with integrants and you wanted to have like the same kind of mix uh, or like the, the same kind of um, repetition of of component groups, um, the process involved for that is you would have to define, um, you know, 
immigrants' uh, methods for um, uh, de you know, defining the behavior of your systems components. So that's this init key multi-method. That's the equivalent of start that I've been showing so far. Um, there's also halt key, which is the equivalent of stop. So you, you define these uh, multi-method behaviors for your different components, which are identified by a keyword, in this case, a server. Um, and uh, we also have like a handler here. So these lines, uh, lines 40 through 56 here, are kind of the equivalent of um, what we're doing with lines 12 through 29 up here with, with the donut system. Just defining like, what is the relationship between some kind of component name and the behavior for that component? Now, if you want to just have one instance of each of these components in Integrant, then it's pretty straightforward. And this is like one of the things that I liked about Integrant is I look at this map and I'm like, oh, this is like really easy to see what's going on. And uh, I really appreciate that. You know, it's, it's like, it gives you kind of like a stripped down almost like skeleton view or, or table of contents view of your system, which I think can be really valuable. But where things get hairy is if you want to have multiple instances of these components. And one way that you can do that is you can have this um, little form here, which is a vector, where, where the first element of the vector is the name of some component. And then the second, um, the second element is just like some other arbitrary um, keyword. And so in this case, we're saying like, if I want to have my you know, first server refer to my first handler, that means I have to you know, create this vector server example one. And then I also have to create um, a similar vector for my first handler, so handler example one. And then like likewise with this network, network discovery component, I have to you know, disambiguate or, or you know, have, have this, you know, uh, kind of like integrant local semantic construct for creating multiple instances of the same component. And I have to do that across the board for this suite of collect like uh, related components, right? And <clears throat> so now I gotta do the same thing for example two. And I think that there are a few, there are a couple of issues with this. One is if you're looking at this, um, if you are not uh, kind of versed in Integrant's kind of local semantics for you know, what does a vector of keywords mean, then it's not at all obvious. Like I would not call this intuitive you know, by looking at it, like what, you know, what the behavior is, like what does this mean, right? And the way to figure this out is that you have to basically pour through Integrant's documentation. And if you're taking the, a beginner perspective on this, then as a beginner, like you don't even really know what to look for. Like, let's say you get put on this project, like you're kind of new to a company, you get put on a project that's using this and you don't even know what question to ask to figure this out. So there's a lot of, you'd have to pour through, I think a lot of documentation um, to actually stumble upon the right answer to the, the question that you can't even necessarily form in your mind um, concretely, right? Um, there's another issue, which like, well, there are two other issues with this. One is that this, um, doing it this way really obscures like what's essential and like what's incidental, right? The essential behavior that you want between these two different component groups is you wanna have, you know, different, different handler messages um, in this case. But, right, so I think in, in, in Donut system, like that's obvious, I hope, right? You are saying explicitly, this is how this instance of this component component group um, differs from the kind of from the template. Um, down here, you have to uh, add a lot of boilerplate that obscures, you know, like the, the actual intention, what you're trying to do, like the, the meaningful meaningful behavior you're trying to produce. And um, <clears throat> the third the third issue with this is that I think it's uh, typo prone. It's a lot more error prone, even even when I was like coming up with these examples, um, copying and pasting this collection of uh, components. Um, you know, I forgot to, to, to put a one um, or change like a one to a two um, from one group to another and got an exception there. I think there are other kind of like deeper issues too that, that I, could, I could go into um, about like integrants, um, 
uh, error handling and like, you know, when you do run into issues, um, you have to kind of be uh, kind of you know, better versed in like the, the, the specifics of how um, Integrant uh, manages this really like kind of impedance mismatch between some kind of globally unique name for a component and that component's behavior, right? Which like this is this is uh, combining, one might say, complexing two things which uh, don't necessarily belong belong together. You know, the the behavior that you want your system to to exhibit uh, is independent of how you want to. Uh, address that behavior or how you want to I, I refer to it or, or identify it within your system. So um, this next example of integrant here is just showing an alternative to doing the above. So instead of instead of doing using this like vector syntax, you can use um, derive to you can derive um, you know uh, specific component instances from like um, just like a kind of base component name. And this has pretty much the same problems as the above. Um, it also requires you to know about keyword hierarchies, which is something that's rarely used in closure, right? So um, integrant is like kind of relying on these um, the, the, these corners of closure, which if you're coming to this as a beginner, you know, like what is derived? Why is this used? I've never seen this before. These are things that are going to trip people up. And but you know, I, I think this ability to have multiple instances of the same component, I've definitely like encountered it myself. And um, <clears throat> I think other I, I know of other folks as well who've kind of kind of run into these issues. So uh, so so my my hope with Donut system is that you know for the most part, you're just dealing with with maps, right? If you want to customize some co components behavior, you just update a map, and you know you're you're just using using like the core closure tools to do that. Um, I didn't really have a comparison to Stuart Sierra's component, but I think some of the same some of the same ideas apply a little bit. For example, um, you know, component uh, relies on protocols, which is I think that that's fine, you know, but again. From the pers from the beginner perspective, it's like protocols are, are, are something that people, um, <clears throat> you know, tend to not learn until uh, you know, I don't know, months or even years into using using closure. I only learned about protocols from having to write about them for my book. So um, you know, I mean, now it's like I'm very com very comfortable with them, but you know, I want this to be beginner friendly and like all this behavior that these component systems um, have, I think it's all achievable just using simple data structures, you know, um, and, uh, and kind of base functions that everyone knows. All right, um, I'm gonna try to go quickly. I'm not sure like really what, what the, the time constraints are here, but I'm gonna go uh, try to go a little bit um, quicker here to, to go through uh, a few more features. Donut system has this idea of named configurations. So um, there's a multi-method donut system config. So that is how you can define some kind of base system um, or just you know, associate a, a system configuration with some name. Um, and this can be handy, for example, like uh, for tests, you can have like a test config. And in this system here, I'm actually, Bruno, I'm gonna do a time check. Like, like how are we? I'm feeling a little bit nervous. <laughs> uh, we have some time, or you, you, okay. you can go on here. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right. So the idea with this system is we're, we're modeling, like we have some HTTP server. HTTP is like the hardest thing in the world for me to say. Um, but anyway, we have an HTTP server and uh, what this is doing is um, it, its handler is just returning good job, but it's also sending this email um, using this send email function. And so uh, you can see that that's defined down here or uh, the reference is defined down here in the comp. And we're gonna, we, we see that it refers to this services send email component. 
And we can see like the, the prod version of this send email component is just to um, print um, the email that we want to send um, and, you know, along with some, some message. So the, the message that we're going to send is um, in this function here is just a string saying got request and the URI of the request. So um, let's see here. So if we start this server, uh, let's see here. Make gonna work. Oh, I forgot to forgot to stop one of my servers. Start that up again real quick. Um, the overall thing that I'm going for here to, is is to show y'all like you can have some base prod definition of a system. And then you can also um, define a kind of like derive a, a test version um, of that, that system. So when we start this system, let's see here. So we have a, starting a server again. And okay, when we go here, we get the message in the browser, good job. And then you can see in the back end here, this kind of like prod email sending function just prints out to my REPL, you know, this message to everybody in London um, uh, got request. And you can see it got a request for just, you know, kind of the root path and then also for like favicon.ico. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, our production system. And what we want to do here is actually create a test system. So um, one way to do that is we can take our, be our base system and then merge in these like um, these overrides for it. So one of the overrides that we have is to start the, uh, the server on port 9090. That's so that we don't con conflict with the, the uh, prod server on port 8080. And um, another thing that we can do here is when starting the system, um, you can further specify overrides uh, for, let me make this a little bit easier to review. You can further specify overrides to, to your system. So um, the, what we're kind of trying to accomplish here is to specify a custom send email component that will um, just conj every message that you want to send onto some atom so that we can then inspect the contents of that atom, you know, makes you know, presumably make some assertions around around that. So so uh, the, the 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 main idea here is that donut system allows you to define test specific behavior locally to the test. Um, and that makes it easier to understand what the test is doing because you can see like, you know, the cust your custom behavior is adjacent to your whole test definition, right? So um, <clears throat> uh, the way that this whole thing works is that we have a, function here that will return a mock email component and it takes some email atom. And so this is like the mock implementation of your email sending component. And this function here, uh, you can see it calls swap on the emails atom and it conjures, uh, you know, this the sent email um, onto that, uh, the vector in that atom. Right, so that lets us write this test where we can say like, all right, I'm gonna create this atom. I'm going to um, specify these component overrides when I start my system. And I'm going to uh, do that by using this you know, mock email send component function, um, passing this emails atom. And then when this gets run, um, it's going to just hit the, the, the Jetty server that gets started two times and then it's gonna print out the emails that were sent by um, you know, dereferencing the contents of the email atom. So you can see that gets shown here. These emails were sent 
and you can see this uh, the atom was updated like the vector um, includes both of the emails that were sent. So um, this doing something like this in integrant is like really, really difficult. Um, and there's no way to do it consistently. Uh, that was one of the things that I struggled with a lot. And so, you know, earlier at the beginning of this conversation, like uh, of this pr presentation, when I was talking about like, what are the tasks involved um, in using uh, a library like this? You know, one of the tasks is writing tests. You know, how do you mock out different parts of your system and test them? And with Integrant, it's like, it's, it's tough because, because uh, of its implementation using multi-methods, there's no way to like, really um, <clears throat> kind of mock out a, a multi-method or at least to do it in a way that's like clean and consistent. Um, or if there is, then like, please let me know because like that was something I struggled with a lot. Uh, but here it's just, um, you, you know, this DS start function is just like a, a little bit of a helper, like a little sugar. Um, the first argument it takes can be the name of some registered, you know, system definition. So earlier when we call you know DS method, um, I'm sorry, def method on donut system config for test, we define some base system. When you call DS start on that base system, um, I didn't you know identified by this keyword, you can then just specify your overrides. And I don't know. I mean, so for me, I think even if this like this might not necessarily be like um, 100% intuitive from the get-go, but it relies on the underlying idea of you are you're simply updating the map data structure which you're using to define your system and its components. And you can see here, here is a component that I want to override, send email. My hope there is that like it's not too much of a, too much of a stretch or too confusing for people to like uh, understand that behavior. Um, and this, but this is also part of like, you know, I'm doing this presentation because if it does seem confusing, I want to hear about it and uh, you know, figure out ways to do it better. All right, so um, yeah, that's named configs and overrides. And um, <clears throat> I wanna cover something that's like a little bit, a little bit more involved. Um, so this will be like I, the, the last major thing um, that uh, well, I wanna talk about here. And so, um, this little demo is pulling in more parts of the, the framework that I've been working on. So there, there's a, there are these endpoint pieces of like middleware and um, you know, route, route handling. And uh, there's also this library, um, uh, Donut Endpoint Test Harness, which um, is the main thing that I wanna show here. But uh, in order to explain it, we'll just cover some of uh, how this system is, is set up. Basically, what, what these lines 12 through 36 are doing is we're creating a, um, a, a very simple like API server. And uh, there's a handler here for that, which takes some router and some middleware, just basically creates a, a ring handler for, for requests. And the routes here, um, it's using this, you know, donut endpoint routes library to take some keyword and associate that with um, with a, a collection of handlers that's um, defined in this namespace. And uh, no, that's incorrect, but that should be fine. So. Um, can see here the handlers what they're doing is um, there's like this collection group which that corresponds basically to like <clears throat> uh, to slash uh, user and this member group which course corresponds to like uh, user ID and when these API requests are saw, uh, uh, received you can see here like the um, for like slash user, we return all users, which are Meghan Markle and Prince William, really trying to keep it like uh, London themed here, or, or at least England themed, which but I guess they're actually not in England anymore. So in any case, um, the, other, the other implementation that we have here is uh, <clears throat> um, just this, you know, 
a toy example of we're filtering users to um, find the user who I, whose ID matches the, the param that gets passed in, right? So these are just like, it's just very simple like endpoint examples or, um, yeah. Uh, and in, in the system that we have here, I don't wanna get too lost in the details, um, but you know, things get wired up here such that it works that you, know, you have uh, some server or you have some handler which can take API requests and return data. And uh, you know, it's all using transit. And the interesting, the, 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 the thing that like I um, kind of more enthusiastic about and wanting to show y'all is that this endpoint test harness library um, kind of ties everything together in such a way that uh, you can um, dispatch requests that look like this. You can say, handle request, and then you just give it the, the name of the method, and then you give it the name of a route, which is users. And then <clears throat> that, will, um, that will automatically internally create the correct actual you know, string path of slash user, for example. And um, then you can also, there's this helper here to just read the body. And, when I run this, you can see that the, the test passes. And part of how this works is you can see this line here, use fixtures. And we call this function here, system fixture. And we, gave it, we give it the name of some configuration, uh, some kind of system configuration. In this case, the name is um, test. And that returns this system that we have right here. So internally, what this library is doing is it will start a system and it will look up in, um, <clears throat> it will start a system and that system will have keys in it like DS defs and then also DS instances. And the instances will have like handler and it will have router. And so what this library, like what this, um, you know, test harness library is doing is it knows where to look under instances to find the handler and to also find the, the router such that when you say handle requests like this, it will generate the correct string path and then um, pass it on to the handler function that is, you know, uh, instantiated in your system. And so this is, I, I feel like uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping this is like wowing y'all, but at the same time, maybe it's not. But for me, I feel like this is something that just removes a lot of boilerplate that at least I've had to deal with of like, all right, like how do I actually, you know, get my handler from my system? How do I actually generate the paths for it in a, in a consistent way? And then this kind of being able to do this, like um, this concisely and, what I hope is expressively, you know, multiplied over however many dozens of, or, or, you know, more API requests um, or API handler tests that you have to write. Um, it's the kind of stuff that, like, I'm trying to do to make lives a little bit easier. Uh, and I'll show, I'll show one more kind of wrinkle on this, which is that um, <clears throat> in this system, you know, the the address, so to speak, for the handler is HTTP handler, and for the router, it's H, it's HTTP router. And so, um, what's interesting about this is that you don't have to actually have that address yourself in your own system. For some reason, if you want to have some group key which is not HTTP but you know something custom of your choosing. You can do that. Same with like the, the names of the components, though I didn't change this here. Um, but what you can do is you can, in your system definition under you know, DS devs, there is a component for the, for the donut endpoint test harness um, config. And you can actually then specify like 
here are the like these are basically the addresses of the components to use to generate these test requests for your tests. So um, by default, <clears throat> this library will look for a kind of uh, a, a certain organization to your system. But if your system is organized differently, those defaults are overridable. And, um, and it works. And I think that that's it for that. And I guess that's it for my presentation. So uh, oh, yeah, let's go ahead and stop sharing. <laughs>